start. But you said 13 was. <laughs> I'll do it. 13.1, page 238. So periodic regulation. Right. That's why I like to do it. Did y'all spend, uh, have we spent enough time studying how the DNA is um, made into protein? Polymerase. Yes. I spent two full days on that. The RNA polymerase comes in and puts on RNA nucleotides and makes a big piece of mRNA. Y'all remember all this? The mRNA has a cap and a tail put on it. The little splices on them splice out the unneeded introns. Y'all remember all this? Then it goes out of the nucleus and it goes to the ribosome. And then at the ribosome, the tRNAs bring in the amino acids, which are joined together by little peptide bonds, one by one, until you get a protein. That's what we spent the last two days on. Okay? And then the protein will eventually fold into its final formation with the help of a couple <coughs> other enzymes. And there you've got a, a finished protein. And a protein can be an enzyme in itself. And then it goes off to do work. As long as you can make proteins, you can have life. Because the proteins can build a cell around you. If you're DNA and you make some proteins, the proteins can then construct the cell around you. And there, that's how life works. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know cover this, but do pro how do proteins know to go in their, is it natured shape? It's I mean, their like shape. The, the natured shape, but like of all the other possibility denatured shapes, it, it finds the one? Well, right. yeah, the, for instance, Let's say, let's say it folds into this shape. And this shape is good at putting together molecules that make, that, that are called phospholipids. And then those phospholipids naturally assemble to, into a membrane. Well, now you've got a membrane that's the outside of your cell. Now, if this shape protein wasn't good at assembling phospholipids, you wouldn't have ever built the membrane. So the proteins that fail to do their job, that cell ends up dying, but a cell with the right code that makes the right protein that can do a job ends up surviving. And so that's how the evolution works. We're going to talk more about that later. Yeah, It's a good question. But it's, it's, it's millions of years of mutations and trial and error until you get the right proteins that work. Yeah. The, the ones that work are, are kept, and the ones that don't work are end up dying. How y'all doing? Okay, so. So, here's the next question that we have in biology. How does the cell know to copy this gene? How does it know... Where's my freaking enzyme? Where's my RNA polymerase? It's up there. It's pink the thing? Gene. That's DNA polymerase. Change it to an R. Oh, the R is the yellow one, right? Yeah, it had a big yellow one. Man! Someone stole it. <laughs> <laughs> How does RNA polymerase know when to attach to the promoter and when to make copies and if, if this is so, if what I've just taught you is just is really happens, if RNA <laughs> polymerase attaches to the promoter and, and, and transcribes the, the code and a protein is made, does it mean that proteins are constantly being made? Yes. If this whole thing is a gene, is this gene constantly being transcribed? And the answer is no, it's not. It's only transcribed sometimes. <coughs> so that's what we're going to teach you in this next chapter, is how the cell knows when to make the proteins it needs. The cell is not smart. It cannot think. It cannot say, I need to make this protein now. I think I'll make it now. It doesn't think. It's an automatic process. And so I'm going to show you today 
uh, discovery that was made, how they figured out kind of how this process works. There's still a lot of research being done. They don't understand it fully. But you'll see a lot of it's automatic. If a cell needs a protein, the protein gets made. And if a cell doesn't need a protein, it doesn't get made. And I'm going to show you how that works. It was first discovered in a bacterium called E. coli. Have you ever heard of that bacteria? Mm -hmm. That's the poop bacteria. It's found in doo-doo. <laughs> Half of doo-doo yeah. is made of this bacteria. Kind of gross, isn't it? So we're finding out why the cell knows when to replicate? No, not, not to replicate, but to make protein. Okay. To make proteins, to do transcription and translation. How's it know? So, let's see. What's the best way to do this? I guess the best way to do this is to erase some of this stuff. To move this over here. Move all of this over here. got so many magnets, I don't know what to do. There once was a man named Mr. Magoo. He had so many magnets, he didn't know what to do. <laughs> Sorry, I just sometimes go off in my own little world. How long did it take you to make that set? It took, it took my detention kids quite a while. Uh, did you really make them do that? <laughs> yeah. You know, if you late too many times, you get detention, you come up here and you cut out magnets for me. Or clean the lab. Or clean the lab. <laughs> okay, so do you, do you remember this? That, that there was a top to this called the promoter region? And I'm going to is that the other region made out of DNA as well? Are you sick? Am I sick? Yes. No? <laughs> no, I'm a little sniffling. Come on. <laughs> he sounded sick. Oh, yeah? Sick like, man, that's, that's sick. <laughs> yeah. Sick -like. That's what I meant. Okay. I'm pretty sick. <laughs> um, the promoter, the end's called the? Terminator. The Terminator. <laughs> that's a good impression. Great movie. Um, and then uh, in this part in the middle is a gene, right? I mean, well, the whole thing's a gene. This part in the middle is instructions for making the protein. And what ends up happening here is this DNA, remember this DNA strand is really long? Do you remember that? It gets really long. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to curve this DNA around like this. And I want to show you that somewhere else on this long DNA strand, just you got to imagine that this is all DNA going all the way through. I just don't have enough models. Okay, that take a lot of attention to. Somewhere else on the DNA strand is another promoter and gene, which is like this. It ends up making a protein and terminator. What's in between them? And maybe some other genes that are in between them. Again, this is a real long DNA variable. <coughs> so, again, the, the RNA polymerase attaches to the promoter, transcribes the gene, and then falls off at the terminator. And whenever a gene is transcribed, it's got some mRNA that goes to the ribosome, and you end up making a protein, right? Yeah. Well, this particular gene is called a regulator gene. Which one is that? And oh. it's... <laughs> Remote control mouse, there it is. You see in the book, see this regulator gene? Mm -hmm. This regulator gene, that little line says there's a bunch of space in between the regulator gene 
and the other genes that we're interested in here. And that regulator gene codes for a, a protein that's called a repressor protein. And so when the regulator gene is transcribed, you end up making a repressor protein. So that's what you mean when you say codes for? Codes for means ends up making the protein. So a regulator gene is a gene somewhere else on a chromosome that codes for making a protein, this repressor protein. And the repressor protein can stick to a site. Now I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. This is the promoter. There's a site that I didn't tell you about before. It's just after the promoter. How many promoters are there? It's called the operator. There's a promoter for every protein that's going to be made, for every gene. There's a, there's a promoter. The promoter is where the, the polymerase sticks to start the transcription. So the polymerase would stick here and then would do transcription. On whatever DNA thing needed copying. Yes, on whatever DNA thing needed copying to make a protein. Wait, what's that repressor protein? Yeah. So the re watch this. Now the repressor protein, after it's made, will just float around and bump into things, <coughs> but will eventually bump into the operator, which has a certain shape that permits binding by the repressor protein. So the repressor protein will click, it'll bind right there. But isn't it inactive? Does it need like something to, to do whatever it does? It's active right now. The repressor protein is active, which means it can bond to the operator. When does it become inactive? What's that? When does it become inactive? I'll show you. You're excited. You're going, going forward too fast. We're what, does it do? what does it do at the yeah. Um, well, what, the, what it does is it blocks RNA polymerase from transcribing this gene. When the, when the repressor protein is in place on the operator, the RNA polymerase cannot bind to the promoter. You see, this is in the way. It's physically in the way. And this RNA polymerase wants to bind and transcribe this gene, but it can't do it. The repressor protein is in the way. The gene is off. It's an on-off switch. That's what a repressor protein is. So when a protein needs to be made, something comes up and attaches to the letter. And Russell. Sorry. How good are you? All right. You're exactly right. The repressor protein is an so. on and off switch for what? The repressor protein is an on and off switch for this gene. So, EKF, take a look at this. With this thing here, this thing cannot attach and transcribe. <coughs> so we aren't going to make any protein because okay, that's in the way. Okay. You see? Yep. Are y'all with me? Mm -hmm. This is awesome, isn't it? Y'all, this is freaking awesome. This is how life works. That's what you're here for. Biology is the study of life. And so if we need this gene to be active, we got to remove this, right? Well, that happens automatically. Let me show you an example of that. This, the, 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 the gene that the book talks about first in your reading is called the whole thing, this whole thing is called the lac operon. The whole process? The whole, the whole process I'm showing you here is called the lac operon. And it's a way for a cell to turn on its gene when it needs it. And in particular, it's to turn on a gene that will break down lactose. Have you ever heard of lactose before? Yeah. We studied it already in this class. Sugar. The enzyme. It's a sugar. It's a, it's a disaccharide. It's a disaccharide. <laughs> and if you remember, a disaccharide a 
disaccharide looks like this. And you find that sugar, this lactose sugar, you find it in milk. Have you ever heard of somebody's lactose intolerant? My mom buys lactose intolerant milk. Yeah. To convince it's better for us. Wait, how is, how? Not necessarily. If you have the lactase enzyme, you can break it down and it's just as good for you as others. But lac, uh, lactose-free uh, milk doesn't spoil as fast. It lasts like two months, whereas other milk spoils in just a couple of weeks. But does it have like less vitamins and stuff? It doesn't. It has exactly the same amount. But what happens is some people cannot digest this sugar because they don't have the enzyme that breaks that apart. So is life? So if, if you drink milk that has lactose and you don't have the enzyme that can break that apart, this lactose sugar will not be digested. It will go all the way through your intestine and end up in your colon where there's bacteria there and they'll eat up the milk. And they eat, and they eat this lactose because they can break that apart and they can absorb the sugars. And so you don't get the nutrients from your milk and worse off, the bacteria get a huge amount of food, so they're multiplying like crazy, producing a lot of gas. People who are lactose intolerant, if they drink milk, they get really bad gas. So bad that it can kill you. That's bad gas. You can't even fart it out fast enough for some people. Isn't that gross? So they have, they can't drink. now. You're laughing right now and going, well, I'm lactose intolerant. I have nothing to worry about. Well, you can become lactose intolerant as you get older. How? So you might worry about it later. Oh, when ba all babies can digest milk, right? From Pretty much, mothers, yeah. Mam mm -hmm. Mammals can, yeah. so they lose, lose it as they get you, older. You lose it at, when you get older, and some people don't lose it. So lactose... Some people <laughs> kind of get it. <laughs> Lactose-free milk lasts longer than lactose? Yes, because bacteria... <laughs> Don't have any sugar to digest, so they don't grow in the milk very fast. Okay, real quick, is lactose milk more expensive? Milk, milk with lactose, is that more expensive than milk without lactose? I think lactose is yes. more expensive. Yes. Milk milk lactose has lactose in it? Yes. Why so not buy the less expensive almond milk? The lactose milk. Yeah. Probably because, like, uh, it's because it spoils fast, and some people don't want milk that spoils But that's milk. cheaper than Some people can't digest lactose. Okay, so enough about milk. Let's go back to this process. Oh my gosh. So, this is a gene. It's actually, in the example they use in the book, it's a series of three. It makes this gene, when transcribed, will make three different proteins. Three proteins that are active in breaking down lactose. This is part of a bacterial chromosome. This is DNA inside a bacterium. And normally, I'll put lac digesting, lactose digesting enzyme code. That's what this is. So we just come out with like a random, uh, I guess, circumstance right now. What's that? Or are we just, are we just naming this like just an enzyme code? Just that's, what I'm, that's what I'm calling it. Okay. And, and, and <coughs> what they call it in the book is structural genes. You see the structural genes? Those are genes for making a structure, a, a protein that breaks down lactose. Is that why they call it lac? That's why they call it the lac opera. Mm -hmm. So take a look at this. Here is a bacterium, bacterial DNA, and this bacterium is not in any, it doesn't happen to be in any milk. So this bacterium doesn't need to digest lactose. So the gene is off. The repressor protein is in place, and this gene is turned off. The bacterium isn't making any enzymes to digest lactose right now. But drop the bacterium in some milk. And it gets down in the milk, and suddenly lactose is all around it. You know what's going to happen? Turn it off. I'm going to use this little yellow <coughs> sphere 
to represent lactose. Suddenly what's going to happen is lactose will diffuse into the nucleus of the cell, or not to the nucleus, it's a bacterium, it doesn't have a nucleus, but it diffuses into the cell and the lactose is going to stick to the repressor protein and when the lactose sticks to the repressor protein, the repressor protein changes its shape, it changes its configuration and it will no longer be able to bind to the operator and it will fall right off. And, now and then that comes a connection. And now the gene is on. The RNA polymerase can attach, it can transcribe the gene, and we will construct proteins that break down lactose and destroy and, and, and tear up all the lactose. And as soon as all the lactose is gone, uh, it'll come back and then get back right to the other. Lee, you're right. It'll it'll digest this lactose. <laughs> It'll digest this lactose, and it'll even digest that lactose. And now, this repressor protein goes back to the shape it was before, and it sticks to the operator, and now the gene's off, because the lactose is gone. We, we digested all the lactose, it's all gone, and the gene turns off. So the gene is only on when lactose is around, and it's off when lactose is gone. So active? Yes. Wait, she had her hand. Where is this lactose coming from? The lactose is in milk. Okay. So if you drop the bacteria in some milk. So it has to be dropped in milk? Yes. Or, or, or not necessarily milk, but anything that has lactose in it. Okay. If, if the bacteria is in an environment with lactose, the lactose genes will come on. <coughs> the genes for breaking down lactose. If the bacteria is in an environment without lactose, the repressor protein is in place and the lactose digesting genes are off. So it's a simple way that you can turn your genes on and off only when you need the proteins. Isn't that efficient? Yes. Are you saying that the operator with the repressor gene can't be in any other cell besides bacteria? You mean here? Well, I mean yeah, here, yeah. This is in a bacteria. This is in a bacteria. But can it be in any other cell? Not, no, eukaryotic cells don't use this mechanism. Only prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotic regulation. Yeah, this is how prokaryotes regulate whether their genes are on or not. Um, and our cells are eukaryotic. Our, all our cells are eukaryotic. So we have actually more complicated systems. Okay, so this gives a lot more this is bacteria. Prokaryotes. This is for bacteria, prokaryotes, archaea. But they use like two. Is you carry? Ours actually is sort of based on this system. It's just a little more complicated. What chapter? So whenever the lactose is the present, one. it's on, and whenever the lactose is on, it's off. Yes, whenever the lactose is present, it binds to the repressor. The repressor changes shape, falls off. Now the gene is on, and we will make proteins that digest lactose. What's the point of that? Why don't you just not have the Why don't you just not have the lactose at all? Like it seems like that was like completely unnecessary. Need it, it well, if this were, if this thing wasn't here, you would constantly be doing this, constantly be making these proteins that break down lactose. And I guess it would kill. That that takes way too much energy. That's a waste. So if this thing's here, we never make proteins that break down lactose. If lactose becomes available, which is something good that a bacteria can use for energy. If lactose becomes available, we will turn on a gene that can break down the lactose and, and make it used by the bacteria. When you say active and inactive, is that what you mean by on and off? I mean, when you yeah. say on and off, you mean inactive and active. Same thing. Yeah. Uh huh. On is active and off is inactive. Yes. I don't get where the lactose like comes from. The lactose is present in milk. Like when you and it's also present in some other things. So this, pretend this is a chromosome. Do you remember what a chromosome is? A long strand of DNA inside a bacterium. This bacterium is not in milk right now. So there's no <laughs> lactose around. So the gene is off. Drop the bacteria in some milk, 
lactose will be present, will diffuse into the cell, will stick to one of these repressor proteins, that will make this fall off, and now we'll start making proteins that can break down the lactose. So it'll only make proteins within milk? Yes, or in any other area that has lactose. Like dairy products? Yes, or just if you have some lactose in the lab and you pour it in some water and mix it up, then you'll have water with lactose in it, and if you put a bacterium in there, an E. coli bacterium, if you crap in the water, <laughs> then suddenly these genes in the E. coli will turn on. That's why you should pasteurize your milk. Kill That's correct, and that kills all the bacteria. Wait, That's what so pasteurization is. Go ahead, mind. See, so when you buy a gallon of milk, there's hardly any bacteria in there. Right. Because they've heated the milk up to a hot temperature and that kills all the bacteria. But there'll still be a little bit. And so after about two weeks, the bacterium are sitting in there, they're eating up all the sugars in your milk, and then you pull the milk out of the refrigerator and the dang milk's spoiled. It's full of bacterium, they're growing like crazy in there. You don't wanna drink that milk. Your body's set up to know that you, won't, you don't wanna drink that because it smells terrible and it tastes terrible. It's, there are clues not to drink spoiled milk. That comes from bacteria growing. <laughs> I drank it one time because I thought it was eggnog. <laughs> oh, oh, when I was making cheese, like the cheese maker said, you don't want, you don't really want to use raw milk because I thought it was eggnog and I drank there's it. a lot of bacteria yeah. and it spoils and right. it could be dangerous to eat. But you don't want to eat ultra high pasteurized milk because all the meat, all the proteins are you know, right. sort of messed up and you can't, right. you can't, can't really make cheese. Yeah, if you heat milk too hot to kill all the bacteria, it ruins the milk. So there's like a fine line between getting it yeah. hot but not too hot. That's the pasteurization process. Yeah. Louis Pasteur invented it. Getting it hot enough to kill most of the bacteria but not ruin the milk. Sounds like... Video footage, watch this. Maybe this will make more sense. This is boring but good. E. coli bacteria generally use glucose as their energy source. However, E. coli can also use lactose when it is available. To use lactose, E. coli must synthesize three enzymes that are not usually present. A region of the bacterial DNA controls the synthesis of these enzymes. This region is called the lac operon. The lac operon is divided into three regions a promoter, an operator, and a region with three structural genes that code for the enzymes the bacterium needs to digest lactose. Structural gene one codes for the enzyme beta-galactosidase, which splits lactose into two simpler sugars. Structural gene two codes for a permease. The permease is a membrane protein that enables lactose to enter the cell. Structural gene three codes for an auxiliary enzyme called transacetylase. An additional gene in a different location on the DNA codes for a repressor protein. The repressor protein turns off the lac operon, preventing the transcription of the structural genes. RNA polymerase binds to the promoter region of the lac operon. However, the repressor protein bound to the operator prevents the RNA polymerase from transcribing the structural genes. Transcription of the genes for the three enzymes is repressed. When lactose is present, it binds to the repressor. The shape of the repressor changes so that it can no longer bind to the operator. RNA polymerase now binds to the promoter and begins transcription of the three structural genes. A single mRNA is made for the three enzymes. This mRNA directs the synthesis of the three enzymes one after another at the ribosomes. The first protein is beta-galactosidase. The second protein is permease. And the third protein is transacetylase. Beta-galactosidase 
breaks down all the lactose, including the lactose bound to the repressor. The repressor returns to its original shape and binds to the operator. Transcription of the structural genes is again repressed. Therefore, the cell does not waste energy making unneeded enzymes. Again, very boring, but good info. That makes sense? So is it not the same thing as like transcription, I mean as um, transcription or translation? Transcription and translation is what happens when RNA polymerase binds here. I know, but then why is it methionine the first one made? Is why is it what? I thought you always, I think that's the first one that's already always made when it's going to the second one when it's methionine. Yeah, methionine is just a, uh, is a single then, amino acid oh, in the long those, strand. Those are yeah, oh, these are proteins. Were, I thought those were amino acids. No, no, they, those are proteins. So <laughs> e each one of those proteins has methionine okay. at its start okay. and folds up into its <coughs> final shape. Okay. What happens, or is there anything that happens if the structural genes are the cell does create one. <laughs> yes, if the repressor protein is screwed up, misshapen or something, so it can't bind to the operator, then RNA polymerase will keep binding, will make too many of these proteins, the cell will waste all its energy making it proteins it doesn't need, and the cell will run out of energy and die. So all of that's bad. And so if you're if you're if this system's not working right, you your cell you you'll die. The cell will die. And it could like that DNA that makes a faulty uh, repressor gene be passed on to Not if the yeah. cell dies. Well I mean like before it dies if it Yeah, it could before it dies, but probably eventually that line of cells that had that mutation that screwed up the repressor protein would, would end up dying out and then wouldn't be passed on for millions of years. The only ones that have survived millions of years are the ones that make correct repressor proteins. So they're not wasting energy. Yes. How y'all doing so far? What about us? Well, that's tomorrow. The way we do it is tomorrow. Um, now, there's uh, this, this whole system I've shown you here. Let me turn this back on. This whole system with this repressor protein, this is called a repressible operon. It's a, rep it's, it's, it's a repressible operon because when lactose is present, it represses and turns off the whole system. Wait, I'm sorry, I, I got that backwards. This is an inducible operon. The, the, the operon is the system, um, this, this whole model that explains how this gene is turned on and off is called an operon. So this whole model is an operon, this hit, including the regulator gene, the promoter, the operator, the genes, the terminator. The whole thing is, is thought of as an operon, a way, to, a way to turn genes on and off. It requires everything to be worked out. So the last so the LAC operon is called a um, is called an inducible operon. Do they use that word in this new book? Mm -hmm. It's called an inducer of the LAC operon. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. so so the lactose is an inducer, meaning yeah. this when the lactose binds to here to the repressor it turns it on. We call this an inducible system where, do you, have you heard the word induce? Mm -hmm. Induce means to make it happen. So the LAC induces the transcription process in the, in the making of the gene, of the proteins. There's another type of operon that kind of works the same way but backwards. The, oh, whole the whole thing. thing. Sorry, okay, got it. The whole thing. 
There's another one they talk about in the reading called the trip operon, TRP. It's actually, it's actually referring to an amino acid called tryptophan. You ever heard of tryptophan? I think I have. It's an amino acid. They say there's a lot of it in turkey, and it makes you tired. It's one of the reasons why turkey makes you tired when you eat it. I don't think that's actually true. I think it's just because people eat a lot when, during Thanksgiving, and the extra uh, food makes you tired because you're spending your energy digesting it. Anyway. The trip operon works like this. The trip operon has genes that don't digest tryptophan, but they are genes for making tryptophan. Genes for making tryptophan. When it makes enough tryptophan, does it switch tryptophan? Yes, exactly. So for instance, tryptophan is one of these 20 amino acids. Let's say the orange one's tryptophan. And if you're going to build proteins, you need tryptophan, don't you? Normally, the gene for making tryptophan is on, meaning normally RNA polymerase will bind to the promoter, copy here, transcribe the gene, and the cell will start making tryptophan. And so it starts putting together these tryptophan, these amino acids, and there you get tryptophan, tryptophan, the little red circle's tryptophan. Now we've got enough tryptophan. So one of the tryptophans will bind to the repressor, change it to a shape that allows it to bind to the operator. And then the gene will be turned off. So the gene only goes off when you have a lot of tryptophan. So it's on, there's all So it's usually, it's on when you don't have much tryptophan. And once you make a lot of tryptophan, it turns off. So it's kind of the other way around. So it's the other way around. It's the same as the lac operon, but backwards. And so, this method of turning on and off genes is how bacteria do it. They use these operon systems. I will show you a video here for the trip operon. One more video, and then we'll be done. Here's the trip operon. In the bacterium Escherichia coli, a group of five genes code for enzymes required to synthesize the amino acid <laughs> All five genes are transcribed together as a unit called an operon. Don't put things up. An operon video. is a group of genes that is under the control of a single operator site. A regulatory protein called a repressor can bind to the operator site and prevent transcription. When tryptophan is lacking in the environment, the repressor is made, but it is unable to bind to the DNA and block transcription. RNA polymerase binds to the promoter site and then proceeds down the DNA, transcribing the genes for the tryptophan biosynthesis enzymes. When tryptophan is present in the environment, the organism no longer needs to make tryptophan. Tryptophan binds to the repressor and activates it. The activated repressor now binds to the operator located within the tryptophan promoter and blocks transcription. That makes sense? The, uh, what does tryptophan do? Tri tryptophan is an amino acid that's present in the long chain that makes up a protein. So if you're going to make proteins, you need tryptophan. So it's the suppressor of the suppressor. The one. That's correct. Yeah. Can I stop videoing? Hold on, one more thing. The AP exam loves questions about controlling when DNA turns on and off. Every exam, they have several. And it's harder stuff. That's one reason why they like to ask about it. This is actually a little bit more difficult than learning how the DNA is made. This is, you know, turning things on and off. And, and, and you really have to understand transcription and translation to get this. So they'll ask you about these things. So we need to make sure we know this well. Okay, question?
You can't? Okay, it's, I just always have these two mixed up. This <laughs> transcription is one with DNA and then, no, no. Yeah. Transcription makes the mRNA. Okay. Translation is when it goes to the ribosome and okay. you make a protein. Got it. The one you're thinking about where you copy the DNA, that's neither it's, transcription it's not, nor okay. translation. It's called replication. There we go. Okay.